us insights into who we are, why we see things certain ways, even why we do what we do or how we do it. And this is not just true of our own personal history, but our history as a society or a culture or a people. Are you guys hearing me now? Thank you. So as I said, this is a process, not just a personal one for us, but one that we can do collectively. And through seeking to understand the past, through engaging with and in various ways interacting with the past, we can get a sense of, as I said, who we are and where we've been, where we're going. We do this in various ways by engaging with and interacting with the evidence, the various artifacts, the stories, the pieces of the puzzle that we have about the past that sometimes are very, very complete and sometimes are a little bit sketchy and we have to fill in the blanks. Right here, I have, what are the pieces that we, we use in this process? Well, here we have some examples right here. The um, the dress is absolutely wonderful, original 18th century dress in an art museum exhibit in Belgium, and just an absolutely gorgeous piece, a, a particular piece of evidence. And then the other uh, image is Versailles, uh, swarming with tourists. The uh, This remarkable artifact that has survived and that people are able actually to go into it and, and uh, be in the space that history took place in. Uh, there are other things. As I said, objects, material culture, art, music, places like Versailles and, and all kinds of places. Uh, the written word, books, letters. All these are pieces of the puzzle that we can draw on to try to create a more complete picture, to try to make connections between things. I mean, like that, that dress before was just lovely, wasn't it? But here's something a little bit different. When you start to put the pieces of the puzzle together, clothing, fashion, uh, the decorative arts, this is from an absolutely wonderful exhibit. Did any of you ever see the da uh, Dangerous Liaisons exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York? Gorgeous exhibit. But part of what they did was that they put all these pieces together that normally would be shown separately and created uh, not just environment. but told stories and tried to draw you into the, the human element of the significance of these artifacts. Uh, it was just, just beautifully done. Now, let's take this a little bit further where you're putting these pieces together. Uh, this happens a lot in museums. I've been in museums for a lot of years, a lot longer than I can. More and more, you know, we are seeing opportunities. This is Hampton Court uh, with living history interpreters uh, representing uh, a royal couple uh, from the uh, very late very, or to early 17th, uh, 17th century to very early 18th century. Hampton Court does this really well. You have this great environment, and then you put people and you put the human element into it and you're starting to put together the pieces of the puzzle and it becomes not just something that you stand back and admire but something that you interact with and something there are a lot of ways that we can do this process and we can uh, kind of approach 
our engagement with the past on an individual level, uh, or we can do it collectively. But I will confess, personally, I, I, I do appreciate and enjoy much more a collective process of looking at the past and engaging with it uh, so that when we so that when we assemble these pieces of the past, trying to create the puzzle, we're doing it together, we kind of share in our under understanding. Uh, we can see how we make connections between people in the past, and we can also figure out how they were in many ways different from us, but also similar to us. I think this is a nice example, these two images. The, the one with the, the tutor gentleman at Hampton Court, uh, the tutor interpreter, very clearly different from everybody around him who he's the modern uh, audience that he's interacting with. But then we look at that, that piece from that scene from the Dangerous Liaisons exhibit, the, the stolen kiss, the, the dogs, the accident with the pottery, the story of what's going on there. There are many ways people in the past are not that different from us. Now there are a couple of different ways, as I said, to, well actually many different ways for us to engage with and interact with the past. Museums, historic sites, uh, a lot of places in the real world, some of which are real, like Hampton Court there is, is a real place and wonderful place. Uh, other places that are, are fabrications. In uh, Colonial Williamsburg, there are a few original buildings, but a lot of it is a recreation. Uh, Plymouth Plantation. Uh, there are a lot, of, or there are restorations, places where we have kind of reassembled the past. Well, we can also do that in the virtual world, uh, as I think is illustrated very nicely in the image there from one of our projects, which is Rocca Sorrentina, uh, that the Villa Vesuviana, the Great Lawn, and uh, just the, uh, the sense of a different time and place that you're getting there, even if it is not entirely perfect. I mean, just, just like you can see with you know, the, the experience there with the, the Tudor gentleman at Hampton Court, there are modern intrusions that audio tours sign behind it, as well as the modern visitors. But you also, if you look very closely at the great lawn there, you'll see there's a, a modern on guard piece to, uh, up towards the house and people in modern guard. But they're they're far enough the, far enough off that they're they're not really intruding on your your sense of the place there. But my point with this is that using different tools, different venues, we can go into the, the, the physical world. We can go into the virtual world to try to better understand the past. But every place has its advantages. Every place has its disadvantages. And nothing is perfect. The, the, this is, I, I love this. These guys, all this great effort that went into these guys doing the, the, these Roman legionnaires. This is uh, in Great Britain. And they're in a car park. And it just, uh, uh, the, the juxtaposition is, I think, uh, a good reminder that, as I said, every means of doing this, of getting into the process of engaging with the past, it has its advantages, it has its disadvantages, and nothing is perfect. We can never entirely go back to the past. We, but we can get close, and we can collectively create an, uh, an experience that will facilitate a process of gaining insights into the past. Here's how I would suggest that you think about it.
think of either living history and uh, interpret and live interpretation in a museum, uh, role playing and uh, various kinds of events that we do in, in virtual historic spaces in a place like Second Life. Think of it as theater. Think of uh, particularly uh, what you are doing as improv theater and that you're all part of an ensemble that um, we, in effect, you have a proscenium arch. This is particularly true in museums where you have to kind of, like going, our, our scene with the Romans there, don't look at the cars, look at the Romans, don't look at the cars. And kind of filter out things the way you do when you're in a theater. There's a proscenium arch, and you pay attention to what's on the stage. Like here in this music room in the villa on, on Rocca Sorrentina, it's, it's a musical afternoon. I think that's Sarah playing the, uh, the harpsichord, actually. Uh, people listening to music, people engaging with each other, and the fact that just outside there may be other things going on. They focused on this stage. We, we can do this in living history as well, it, and, and I do include reenacting. That's a pretty realistic looking picture, isn't it? Actually, that's in a uh, muddy ditch in a field in Pennsylvania in about 1981. And uh, that is, again, a, a, a sage set, in effect, that an ensemble of improvisational actors have positioned themselves in this case, living history reenactors, guys doing World War I, that when you treat it as theater, you can accomplish some remarkable things. Just as being in a theater and watching a really good play transports you to a different place and a different time and, and engages you with different people, we can do that in this process with historical environments that we recreate, that we possibly And you know it's interesting here. I just I wanted to compare this. This is the uh, the virtual space uh, of one of the 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 World War One. I think this is the the World One War One poetry sim, uh, which includes a, a historical environment. But you know, looking at that recreated space in the trench in the field in Pennsylvania in 1981. You know, it's in your virtual space, you're not going to be wet and cold and muddy the same way that you are in that field in Pennsylvania. But you're still getting a sense of something, of a different time, a different place, and a different set of situations where you have to put yourself into the mindset of a person that is in some ways similar to you perhaps, but also in very different circumstances and who may have been looking at things in different ways. I was talking a little bit about the idea of the advantages and disadvantages of uh, the different strategies that we can use in pursuing this process of engaging with the past. But, um, you know, even though there are advantages to that muddy field in Pennsylvania where you can see, uh, again, you're muddy, you're cold, you're wet, uh, people are shooting at you, yeah, you're not going to actually get hit by bullets, yeah, you're not actually going to get dysentery, you're not going to get blown up by a great big shell, but it, it can engage you and give you a sense of the past in different ways. There are other advantages that in a virtual space that we do have. For example, this is Deadwood 1876 from a number of years ago. So it was, was a really well done uh, role play, living history, historical kind of sim. 
and a great effort went into making it as authentic as possible within reason. Um, you know, and again, it's still the kind of thing you're not going to get cholera, you're not going to get dysentery, somebody's not going to shoot you over a card game and you're going to, well, actually you would get shot during a card game every now and then, but you weren't going to actually die from it uh, or get some kind of a horrible infection. Uh, you're not going to die during childbirth, all the other things that go with if this, you were really in Deadwood in 1876, but you have an opportunity in these virtual historical spaces to create very much a sense of a different place and time, a feel, a, an overall ambiance of the environment that sometimes in a real world kind of recreation you just can't do. This is Rocca Sorrentina again, and, and you know you can see obviously, if you were a living history museum or a um, a reenacting group, it'd really be hard to have a whole island in the Bay of Naples uh, with ships and with breakers crashing on the rocks and a villa and a church and everything that goes into this this very complete. This is this is Edo Castle, another absolutely wonderful uh, historical environment that was created. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still out there. I, I hope it is. But the, there are, are places like this that have come and gone. Uh, they are. Uh, I mean, that's in a, in a way that's the beauty of it. That unlike that muddy field in Pennsylvania where a bunch of guys had to get together, pool their money, get some backhoes, dig trenches, build dugouts, uh, build bunkers, string barbed wire. It's a very long-term commitment. This kind of virtual environment gives us an opportunity to try different things and try them quickly and adapt them. One of the things that I really like about our project in Raqqa is that it's always, it's like a real community, like a real town on a real island because it changes and people come and go and, and new things are built and old things get taken down and other things get incorporated just like a real organic uh, physical community. And it, eventually when it's done, everything has a lifespan, we close it down, we do something else, and you're not left with big holes in some farmer's field that you have to get a rent a backhoe again and fill them in. But in addition to this matter of the physical sense of space, there is the process of engaging with people. As I said, you can do uh, an exploration of the past on your own through reading, through visiting places, through collecting things, however you're doing your own research and writing. You can do it individually, but the wonderful thing about these virtual spaces is being able to engage with folks like these on the steps of the villa. This is, these, this is just a sampling of our community uh, on Roca Sorrentina, and I can tell you that in that group there are people from uh, at least a half dozen different countries, people from a lot of different backgrounds including the sciences, history, art, uh, business, uh, people who are, are homemakers and caregivers and, and people in medicine, and they're all learning from each other. And I think this is another aspect of where a community in a virtual space can be like a real life community where there are lots of different people from different backgrounds. So you've got these spaces. Uh, they are spaces where uh, it is in many ways simpler to do things than it is in the physical world. In some ways more complete 
uh, where you can have these people who you can interact with. People that you can uh, share ideas and information and and whom you can socialize with. There is a social element to this. Actually, both of these two situations in the physical world, that muddy, that muddy ditch in Pennsylvania is a social venue just as much as a... Uh, uh, this was from when one of our friends put together a World War II hangar dance. Uh, it was a wonderful, immersive experience uh, with the music and the people. But this is a, this is a social process for us. And it is one in which we can recreate events and elements of everyday life, the ordinary as well as the extraordinary. Here we have uh, uh, some of our, our fellows on um, Roca Sorrentia uh, practicing for a Masonic, 18th century Masonic ritual, uh, which they had to do research for, which they had to figure out what the process was and actually uh, uh, do a script, and uh, and then people came to to the event, and it was a, uh, a a really intriguing process that they went through to make. But as I said, it it's not just about extraordinary events; it's about the everyday. It's about uh, kind of, again, drawing connections, finding places where people in the past would have experienced and understood things like the transitions of life in, and family and loss in the same way we do. Now this is where it gets really interesting. To be able to do these things We've come to the conclusion, one, one of our friends, actually the, the, the lady in the, the longer Victorian dress there, came up with a description for this process. She called it cooperative self-directed learning. And it is a process where we are sharing information, we are sharing ideas, people are getting inspired uh, by something that they read or they hear about, or, or suddenly all of it. And actually, this happens in living history, too. I can almost guarantee you that those guys sitting at the, the, that trench, that a couple of years before that, they were sitting at a Civil War event in a, in a big field, and saying, boy, you know what would be cool? We ought to do World War I trench warfare. And somebody, oh, man, that would be so cool. Let's do that. Well, right now, they're sitting in that trench in, 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 in Pennsylvania going, you know, wouldn't it be cool to do Spanish Civil War, anarchists and communists and all that? And, and yeah, we ought to do that. People feeding off each other's ideas and enthusiasm. Let me give you another example of this happening on Raqqa. That something uh, we had uh, someone. Uh, Realize once some people in the community realize, oh, this this year is uh, the uh, the anniversary of the first balloon flights, the Montgolfier balloon fight flights last year, uh, eighty three, and we ought to do something about that. So people started doing research and sharing ideas and information with each other, and a couple of the guys said found out about there had been a in like eighteen oh seven a duel in balloons where two Frenchmen. You know, instead of dueling on the ground, went up in balloons and shot at each other until one guy crashed and got killed, and, and honor was satisfied. But they said, wouldn't that be interesting to do that? And so they, uh, Sarah helped them with building the balloons because this was also about sharing skills as well as ideas. And they did research on, and you'll notice in this, there's a Montgolfier hot air balloon. And there's a hydrogen balloon, which they were developed around the same time. Uh, and so there were the two different examples. They had the, the dual 
lots of people came, information was shared, everybody had a good time. This is where it becomes, you know, learning in, in reinforced by play. Uh, this is when, when I think Sarah started using the term for what we do as Montessori for adults. And uh, all this new material, new information uh, became very accessible and very memorable for a lot of different people. And Sarah got inspired and she did uh, an exhibit, a virtual exhibit about aeronautics and its origins in the 18th century. And, and that exhibit, by the way, is still up and you guys ought to go over and look at it. So, this process of cooperative self-directed learning, it is not always tidy, it is not always organized. But it does take place and it is very real and we can accomplish Ah, that's right, it, it was. Are we going to put it back up, Sarah? I would like to. It was a wonderful exhibit. Um, but through these opportunities that we find in virtual spaces, we can not only create environments, not only create objects and artifacts, but we can interact with them, we can live with them. Here's a, um, one of our friends, Cuthbert, he, he built that little uh, British steam engine before. He's also he's working on the Orient Express now. He's, he's not just building the thing, but actually living with it and working uh, with it and interacting with each other in these spaces and places and artifacts. And what I want to finish by saying is that perhaps the best part of this process of cooperative self-directed learning is how we encourage each other how we inspire ourselves and each other. And I think that is what the rest of this very fine conference is going to be. A number of different people who are going to be giving you very specific examples that I think are going to inspire you, that I hope will give you ideas, that will get you motivated to try new things, to learn new things, and to help each other with this process of better understanding our past, who we are, and who we can be. Thank you.